Okay. Uh, I, uh, you look like him. I knew him. I dealt with him from 1985, 86, 87. He uh, settled the Major League Baseball umpire's dispute in 1985. And uh, I met him through Richie Phillips, who was the head of the World uh, Umpires Association. And uh, Richie Phillips uh, told Peter Eubroth, the baseball commissioner, he said, um, about arbitration. And Eubroth said, well, who do you got in mind? And he said, Dick Nixon. Dick Nixon, get out of here. And they talked to Dick Nixon. Oh, please call me Dick. Um, <laughs> and, and he settled it. And I got to know him after that. I went to his, uh, his office, which was in lower Manhattan, across the street from the uh, courthouse, Foley Square, uh, Southern District. And uh, he, he walked into his office. It was a miniature Oval Office, except it had flags all over the place and pictures of him with Mao Zedong and, and Gold in My Ear and all these other people. But that's for another day. Uh, Title IX, passed June 23rd, 1972. Title IX gave women the equal or equal access to educational programs in college as to men. Now, uh, I don't mean to say this in terms of, I'm trying to be age appropriate here, but I was on the cusp of Title IX. I knew some people graduated high school in 1972 who did not benefit from Title IX, and I knew some people who graduated after I did in 1974 that became lawyers. And very simply put, that uh, prior to Title IX, only 7% of law school was made up of women. 9% of medical school made up of women. Today, more than half of the people in medical school are women. More than half of the people in law school uh, are women as well. And some of you probably didn't realize it, but were discriminated against when you were younger and weren't able to necessarily go into the fields that you want. Of course, you had uh, options available. You could be nurses, teachers, secretaries, or bell, to bell telephone operators. <laughs> that was basically it. There were, of course, exceptions to that rule. But for the most part, that was what is, was available to women. So he signs the law uh, into, uh, he signs the legislation into law June 23rd, 1972. It's called the Patsy T. Mink Equal Opportunity and Education Act. It's uh, part of the Education Amendment of 1972, or Title IX. What's excuse me? What, what I was wondering if it was Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon. Yeah. But if you knew him and you met him, and I didn't know him, but I met him in, in a few times, oh, please call me Dick. We want to be known as Dick Nixon, so he's Dick after that. 1971, the Congresswoman Patsy Mink from Hawaii and Edith Green, a Congresswoman from Oregon, were given the chance to help other women pursue their dreams without gender discrimination, and they ran with it. Uh, the pre-1960s thinking. This is San Francisco, and uh, I've been in San Francisco since the pandemic. Um, I was in San Francisco in November of 2019, and when I'm in San Francisco, I go down to the Fisherman's Wharf. Uh, we go to El Yodo's, uh restaurant, but that's another story. But I go to this place. This place is called the Musée Magnifique. And uh, if you are like me and love old pinball machines or old skee-ball machines or that type of thing, this is the place you go to, which is also filled with Nickelodeons. This particular Nickelodeon, uh, it, uh, it caught my eye. And for the reason, to be happy, see what every married woman must not avoid. And, you know, you put your nickel in the Nickelodeon, right? And you look, and there's this movie that says, hey, married woman, make sure your husband's happy all the time. Do everything he wants. That is all. That is it. That is it. Nothing else. But, you know, seriously, you know, if you look at some of the things from the 19th century, uh, to be happy, see what every woman, married woman must not avoid, actually did take place. 
It's June 23rd, 1972. Title IX of the Education Amendments is enacted by Congress, signed into law by Richard Nixon. The sponsors of the bill in the Senate, the Indiana Democrat, Birch by. And in the House, the uh, Oregon Democrat, Edith Green. Title IX prohibits sex discrimination in any educational program or activity receiving any type of federal financial aid. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you were married before 1972 or married in the 60s? So you were, you were, okay, so you were married in the 60s. Did you have a first name? Did you have a first name? Well, let's, before you say yes, let's, let's take a look at the West Orange, New Jersey Library. I spoke there about three years ago. The building uh, was put up in 1959, and you can see it's the West Orange Public Library. Library Board of Trustees. Mrs. Simon J. Griffinger, President. Mrs. She doesn't have a first name. Samuel A. Cristiano. Samuel has a first name. Roger W. Doran. Roger has a first name. Herbert J. Dwyer. Herbert has a first name. Mrs. Alex J. Katz. She doesn't have a first name. James J. Sheeran, the mayor, he has a first name. Dr. Rexford S. Souther, superintendent of schools, he has a name. William H. Lehman, the architect, he has a name. Now, uh, when my mother-in-law passed away eight years ago, we're going through some of her old stuff, and we're looking at the old stuff, and we're looking at things like wedding invitations, and there was always Mr. and Mrs. Edwin Schaefer and family. She had some newspaper clippings from when she was the president of a local women's club, and everybody in the picture, all the women, she was Mrs. Edwin Schaefer, and there was Mrs. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so. Did you have a name? Or now when you think back, because I had a woman about four years ago said, you made me sad. I said, you made you sad? Why'd you make me sad? I didn't realize I didn't have a name. I was Morris's wife. He was a good provider, don't get me wrong. But you're right, every invitation, Mr. and Mrs., every bank statement, Mr. and Mrs., it was his, his name. Now, how many of you actually got things in your own name? You did. Yeah? Well, you're rare exceptions. <laughs> oh, hey, how many of you wanted to be a stewardess in 1965? This is an ad for Delta Airlines. Welcome aboard Delta, 1965. Stewardess applications. Must be between the ages of 20 and 26. Never married. Radiant good health. Must adhere to strict figure control standards. They measured you. They measured your bust, your waist, and your bottom. Straight teeth and legs. Let's put it this way. If you're bow-legged, you couldn't get a job. Uh, clear, smooth skin. Willing to retire between the ages of 30 and 32 to take on the greater complexities of marriage. <laughs> Looking for stewardesses. Oh, how many of you used to work, watch Password? Password. Alan Levin, and Carol Burnett's there, and Mitch Miller, who lived in Rockland County, Pomona. Alan Levin, when a woman would come in, he would ask, are you married or are you a working gal? Family passports, it's my in-laws. Family passport, Edwin Schaefer. Oh yeah, he's got the wife Blanche, but the passport's in his name. His name. You know, he's, they got his height and all that other stuff. And the picture, that's the passport. That's the passport, it was in the husband's name. Family passport. So anyway, the Patsy T. Mink Equal Opportunity and Education Act, this is germinating while uh, all this is going on. And uh, so, uh, I went backwards. <laughs> but anyway, there's Patsy Mink. Patsy Mink was a congresswoman from Hawaii. Except she got married to a guy from Pennsylvania and she lost her citizen uh, Hawaiian residency. Uh, she had ability, but Patsy Mink was elected the first female president of the student body at Maui High School, Territory of Hawaii. She was the valedictorian 
of her graduating class in 1944. She had a political career. She went to law school, University of Chicago. Smart woman, very smart woman. She was politically ambitious. 1958, she was elected to the territory of Hawaii Senate. When Hawaii became a state, that was dissolved. Uh, and she tried to become the congresswoman, running for a seat, first seat ever, but lost in the Democratic primary to Daniel Inouye. 1962, she goes into the Hawaiian State Senate. 1964, she uh, is victorious in her race for Congress. She was an early supporter of a successful effort to allow female members of Congress to use the House of Representatives gym. <laughs> they won't let you do the Indian clubs. Look at these guys. No women. No women allowed. She was a champion of women's rights. She avoided being characterized as a feminist. In the late 1960s, she became an outspoken uh, opponent of the Vietnam War. But her real, real passion in Congress was to work in behalf of civil rights, including those of women and children, as well as health care, welfare, and education. Well, she's valedictorian, right? She ends up at the University of Hawaii, and uh, she wants to go to medical school. She's got the grades for medical school, but guess what? She applies to 12 different medical schools. How many accepted her? Zero. Zero. I'm going to tell you a couple stories here. I have a friend uh, by the name of Fran Cummings. She's about 85 years old. She lives in Hawaii now. She grew up in Utah. About 1956, she was the valedictorian of her high school in Utah. She came from a long, long uh, family line of geologists, and she wanted to become a geologist. So she decides to apply. She's got the valedictorian thing. She's got the great test scores, and she starts going from school to school. And no, 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 no. <laughs> finally, finally, she asked one of the one of the people said no. She said, "Why? Why aren't you taking it?" He says, "Well, Fran, here's the problem. You're too pretty." <laughs> she is she's still a good-looking woman in her 80s. You're too pretty. And if we go out on an archaeological dig, all the guys are going to look at you and not concentrate on the dig. Same thing in class. They're all going to look at you because you're so pretty. And because you're so pretty, you can't come to school here. Mm -hmm. That was the excuse. She ended up becoming an educator and actually ran some uh, departments. Her husband was also a professor uh, at the various schools that they were at in science. Uh, but Patsy Mink, and I have a lot of those stories. I'm not going to go through all of those stories. I'm going to give you one more, though. Uh, a number of years ago, I was speaking in Stanford at a group. And uh, we're talking about this. And the guy said, can I interject? I said, sure, no problem. He said, I went to medical school in 1960. And he said that uh, there were 96 of us. And we're all in the room, and the, and, and the dean of the school is there. And we're all sitting down. And he tells the four women, there were 92 men and four women, the four women, stand up. Next question is, why are you here? Why are you taking a place of a man? Are you here to meet a guy to get married? And then you're going to get married, have kids, and never use whatever you learn here? Is that what it's all about? You're here to marry somebody? He said the four women stuck it out to spite the guy. <laughs> so she decided to go to law school and ended up at the University of Chicago, but she continued to face sexism. She was denied a job because she was a married woman. Not only was she a married woman, she married somebody at the University of Chicago who came from Pennsylvania, and because she married a mainlander, she was no longer a citizen of Hawaii or resident of Hawaii. She was the resident of whatever, wherever he was, except he never lived, she never lived in Pennsylvania. They went to school, and by the way, at the University of Chicago, she was taken in as a foreign exchange student, even though she was from the territory of Hawaii. Uh, and she had to fight her way. She tried to s start her own law practice. But the government officials there said, no, you can't do that because you're not an Hawaiian resident. But I graduated Maui High School. I was valedictorian. I went to the University of Hawaii. Yeah, but you married that guy from uh, the University of Chicago. She had to fight to take her uh, uh, bar exam. She won. Uh, and she became the first Japanese-American 
woman lawyer in Hawaiian history. Congresswoman, 1965 to 77, 1990 to 2002. There she is on the left and Edith Green on the right. Edith Green, elected to Congress in 1954, and right away she's in Congress, she gets on the job and she wants to fail. Well, let me ask you a question. Should women get the same amount of money for a job as a man if the jobs are equal? Yes, yes. or no? Yes. yes. Okay. In 1955, Edith Green proposes the Equal Pay Act to ensure that men and women were paid for equal work, uh, equally. Uh, the bill signed into law in January 1963 by John Kennedy, but uh, do you think the law was ever, uh, was ever really applied? Yes or no? No. Now, it's, it is the law of the, of the land, but it's never been applied. And there is Edith Green. The Library Services Act, uh, access to libraries in rural communities, that's hers. Higher Education Facilities Act in 1963 is hers. Higher Education Act 65-67, all hers. And uh, for the work she was doing, she was nicknamed the mother of higher education or Mrs. Education. And I kind of figure they were not glowing terms. Uh, I went to Spring Valley Junior High School in the late 1960s. And uh, I was there through 1970 before I went up to Spring Valley High School, Rockland County, New York. And uh, there were programs for boys after school, but none for girls. None for girls except maybe future teachers of America. And so she wants to uh, fix this inequity. And she helps uh, introduce an education bill with provisions providing gender equality in education. Um, that's Kay Switzer. Know who Kay Switzer is? She ran the Boston Marathon 1967 <laughs> under an assumed name. Not an assumed name. She just didn't do her full name. She just had K. Period Switzer. And uh, this guy here, this guy by the name of Jock Semple. Jock Semple ran the, uh, well, he didn't run the Boston Marathon, but he was the guy who organized that year's Boston Marathon. And by the way, look at that picture. Let's go back to the picture. Does it look like he's about ready to push her into the cement? Yeah. Which yeah, could really good. hurt her, right? She lands on her face, break a jaw, break a nose, lose teeth, cut you up. Uh, fortunately for her, that's her boyfriend, uh, who's six foot two and weighs 235 pounds and played football at the University of Syracuse. So he kind of got in between Jock Semple and, uh, and Kay. Catherine Switzer was a runner. While studying journalism and running for fun at Syracuse University, one of her coaches, Arnie Briggs, after she told Arnie, hey, I think I'm going to run this thing, uh, said, uh-uh, fragile woman, couldn't run the Boston Marathon. Now, let me ask you a question here. If women are so fragile and they're so dainty, how come they outlive men? It's an old Myron Cohn joke. Because they want to. <laughs> I had to interview Myron Cohen in 1978. Lived in New Hems on New Hempstead Road in, in uh, Clarkstown, New York. And yeah, I'm doing this interview, and he opens the door, and he's in these plaid pajamas. <laughs> he said, you're not doing television. Sit down. Come in. You want something to eat? Well, anyway. So she uh, trained and entered the race as K.V. Switzer. And uh, there is Semple trying to get rid of her. Uh, Tom Miller is her boyfriend. He played football at Syracuse. He was a nationally ranked hammer thrower, and uh, he decided he was going to push Semple to the ground. The only reason he ran the race, he wasn't a runner. If she could run it, I'm going to run it. And she finished in four hours and 20 minutes. Title IX, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in be denied the benefits of or subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal assistance. Title IX was highly controversial. Uh, there were a lot of people who supported the law, including Ted Stevens, a Republican senator from Arizona, uh, from Alaska, and uh, Birch Bayh from Indiana. But there were some others who thought Title IX was too dangerous forcing women, forcing schools rather, forcing schools to accept women, and that would ruin education. 
You think having women in school ruins education? But that's what people were thinking. Ted Stevens was an ally, senator from Alaska. And that's my friend Donna Deverona, who lives in Stanford, who won two gold medals in the 1964 Tokyo Olympics in swimming. And there she is with her gold medals. And I, I call her every once in a while, how are the medals doing? <laughs> They're fine. Uh, and she said, without uh, Senator Stevens as a co-sponsor, I doubt that Title IX would have survived. It was a time when we needed a strong Republican. He championed the rights of athletes and protected Title IX, as well as always being there when there was a challenge to the law. Why did Stevens support Title IX? He had a couple of reasons. A, he was a tennis player. B, he had girls. They couldn't play Little League Baseball. He wanted to play Little League Baseball. So he saw a value in sports and recreation in both his personal and professional life. Title IX would provide women's equality in sports. Uh, it's my friend Harvey Schiller, uh, Ted Stevens and Donna Deverona. Harvey was uh, the commissioner of the Southeast Conference College and uh, made sure there was a lot of inclusion with women. That's Birch Bay, Indiana Senator Birch Bay. Uh, before I get into Birch Bay, uh, I'm going to go back to Spring Valley Junior High School, 69-70. And I had a teacher by the name of Stewie Gates, who's still with us. He's in his 90s now. Stewie was a stout guy with a short haircut and horn rimmed glasses. And I remember his class better than any other class I ever took. And uh, for various reasons, and I'll tell you this one. So we're in ninth grade. I'm 13. Everybody else is 14 because I was kicked out of kindergarten. They had no place to put me, so they put me in first grade. Can you imagine this? They put me in first grade because they talked too much. <laughs> Couldn't handle me. Neither could Mrs. Topar in first grade. But anyway, Stewie Gates. So, yeah, we're all sitting around, and Stewie's giving us advice. He says, look, next September, you're going up to Spring Valley Senior High School. You're going to take the PSATs. You're going to take the PSATs and see where you're at. And then two years from now, you'll take the SATs, see where you're at. And then three years from now, you're going to go visit colleges to see where you want to go. Oh, and for all the girls in the class, some of you are going to college to major in three letters. You know what the three letters are? Oh, maybe. M-R-S. She got an M-R-S, right? So, that was Stewie Gates, 1969-1970. This is Birch Bayh on the Senate floor in 1972 in his remarks about the bill. We're all familiar with the stereotype that women are pretty things who go to college to find a husband and who go on to graduate school because they want a more interesting husband, and finally married, have children, never work again. The desire of many schools not to waste a man's place on a woman stems from such stereotype notions. But the facts absolutely contradict these myths about the weaker sex. Again, if they're weaker, how come they outlive us men? Uh, and it's time to change our operating assumptions. While the impact of this amendment would be far-reaching, it's not a panacea. It is, however, an important step in the effort to provide the women of America something that is rightfully theirs, an equal chance to attend schools of their choice, to develop the schools they want and apply those skills with the knowledge that they will have a fair chance to secure the jobs of their choice with equal pay for equal work. Question for you. Is it your right to have an education, or is it the law for a woman? Probably. It's the law. It's the law. It's not your right. This thing could disappear at any time. You don't have a right to education. You're protected by a law. Oh, remember I talked about women? Women's rights. This is all through the years. Women's rights. Henry Ford Museum, where I was at five years ago, which is kind of odd because it's a civil rights museum in addition to a automobile museum, considering Henry Ford, that makes it odd. Women's rights denied. In the 1800s, American women had fewer rights than a male inmate at an insane asylum. <laughs> women could not vote, serve on a jury, testify in court, hold public office, attend college, practice law. If a woman were married, it was illegal for her to sign a contract, own or inherit property, 
keep or invest her own earnings, have automatic rights to her children. Women were expected to center their lives around family and home, obey their husbands in all matters, not voice strong opinions in public, behave in a refined, polite way. You can imagine the suffragettes when they're out there wanting to vote, and this is what's going on at the same time that they're trying to get the vote. Title IX was enacted as a follow-up to passage of the Civil Rights Act on July 7, 1964. The 1964 Act was passed to end discrimination in various fields based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin in the areas of employment and public accommodation. The 1964 Act did not prohibit sex discrimination against persons employed at educational institutions or women who were trying, who were applying to colleges and they wanted to be mathematicians, lawyers, doctors, whatever, uh, engineers. No, 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 we don't want you, don't have to give you a reason. Women students were denied equal opportunities under the law in academics. Women applicants were routinely denied access to medical, law, and other graduate schools. Women athletes were denied equal participation in sports. Similarly, female faculty members were denied equal compensation and promotion. Today's rise in all academic disciplines and in sports at every level in many ways is a direct outgrowth of the landmark Title IX legislation. Uh, I signed it into law. Uh, Nixon signs it into law. Been many times in the last 50 years where the law was challenged, 24 times in Congress by 2007. But uh, I signed the bill. <laughs> Nixon, when he signs the bill, speaks about desegregation and busing, but doesn't mention a word about the expansion of educational access for women that he had enacted. You're talking now, 50 years later, hundreds of millions of American women now can't become doctors and lawyers. Only a select few prior to 1972 could. That's uh, Bernice Sandler. She was an activist trying to get this thing done. God bless you, Title IX. Uh, a benefit, a benefit which you probably never thought about. Sandler, if girls got pregnant, they were literally kicked out of most schools. Very often, people knew who the father was. He didn't receive any punishment at all. Women teachers also faced tough consequences for getting pregnant, routinely losing their jobs when they began to show. In fact, there was a law in New York City for quite a long time that a woman couldn't get married and be a teacher for a very, very long time. And that's Bernice Guerra. Bernice Guerra was a minor league professional umpire. Bernice Guerra is sitting around her house, this is about 1965, and uh, she's in Queens, New York. And she's talking to her husband, Steve, and it's like, you know, there's got to be more to life than just going to Bohack supermarkets, clipping coupons, and shopping. There's got to be more to life. And her husband says, well, what do you like? She says, I don't know. Well, what would you like to do? I don't know, I like baseball. Maybe I could be a baseball umpire. 1960, she goes to umpiring school. 1969, Bernice Guerra receives a contract from the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues to work in the Class A short season New York Penn League. She gets a letter or a telegram from the uh, National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues President Philip Python. Basically says, I'm not approving your contract. Well, hey, wait a minute. I've, I've got experience, National Baseball Congress. I've, um, I've been in, you know, I'm an umpire in, in the projects and all that. What do you mean? Well, there she is. Um, part of the problem was she was 38 years old, was five foot two, and weighed about 128 pounds. And uh, there was one guy, a guy by the name of uh, Dorothy, who uh, said, Ed Dorothy, who said, uh, no. Our qualifications for an umpire 21 through 35, at least 5 foot 10, 170 pounds. She sued New York State Division of Rights versus the New York Pennsylvania Professional Baseball League. Court ruled in 1972 
that being a man is not a bona fide occupation qualification for umpires. Hey, you can be a woman and miss calls too, right? It's not exclusive to men making wrong calls on the baseball field. On June 24th, after three years, she gets onto the field in Geneva, New York, and she umpires the game between the Geneva, New York Rangers and the Auburn, New York Phillies. The woman in blue. The night before, now think of this mentality. Think of this mentality. The night before, she's in Geneva. And they don't have Ritz Carlton Hotels in Geneva. She's at a Super 8 or a Hotel 6. That's what she's at. Uh, and there are eight guys who come to the hotel and start screaming and shouting and cursing at her. Which, you know, think of the mentality. Don't you have anything better to do? Why are you worried about this? And not only that, how about the other people in the hotel? You know, why are you doing this? They might be busy doing something else at those kind of hotels. Anyway, uh, the afternoon before the game, she stayed inside her room. She studied baseball players and professional baseball rules. She didn't, couldn't, she didn't eat. Uh, her stomach churned at the mention of food. And then she gets on the baseball field. And there she is, Bernice Guerra. And there he is, Nolan Campbell. And they get into an argument on the field because she overturns a uh, call and it becomes double play. She was working the bases. She overturns the play and Nolan Campbell, the Auburn manager, comes out and starts arguing with her. Now, in minor league baseball, there's a home plate umpire and there's somebody else watching the whole field, only two. And Nolan Campbell, the, Phil the Philadelphia Phillies minor league manager, they're having this argument, and she, he tells her, you should be in the kitchen peeling potatoes. <laughs> he throws her out of the game. But here's the next thing. Her umpiring partner puts her arm around Campbell, after she had just thrown him out, and they walk arm in arm to the dugout. Oh, don't worry about it. After the final out, Bernice Guerra left the playing field. It was a doubleheader, two games, and uh, never returned as a professional umpire. She resigned because of lack of cooperation from her fellow umpires. My father-in-law was a groupie. Oh, he was a big, big time groupie. He used to go with me, we used to go, I used to go interview people and he'd take his camera and take pictures of people like Billie Jean King, who I love. How many of you like Billie Jean King? Billie Jean King, she's great. I mean, she's got the great sense of humor. She's funny, she's engaging, and she's tough. She's tough. She lets you know where she's coming from. But again, she's funny and engaging. Billie Jean King, women's rights. Billie Jean King was a civil rights pioneer, but she captured people's attention long before that battles of the sexes made for TV extravaganza, done by my friend Shelley Saltman, uh, against Bobby Riggs at the Houston Astrodome in 1973. While Patsy Mink is pushing ahead, women's tennis had stalled. Women's tennis was stuck in old traditions. Uh, women were second-class citizens. In fact, Billie Jean King was Mrs. King. She wasn't Billie Jean King, she was Mrs. King. Uh, and she was pushing ahead. There she is in 1967 taking on people, uh, like the United States Lawn Tennis Association and its policy of paying the top players under the table so they would go into tournaments. She denounced the USLTA's practices as corrupt and kept the game highly elitist. The elitists didn't forget her. They were out together. They were out together. 1968, she wins 750 pounds for winning the Wimbledon. The men's uh, champion, Rod Laver, took 2,000 pounds. The men could get nearly 15,000 pounds in prize money. The women, $5,600, uh, or pounds, rather. 1970, the Italian Open, Ilya Nastassi was paid $3,500 to win. Billie Jean King got $600. The USLTA was getting even with Billie Jean King and others. No tournaments for you in 1970. And there she is in 1972. She wins the US Open in 1972. She gets $15,000 less than Ilya Nastassi. She says, I'm not coming here next year unless you equalize the pay. They did in 1973. You've come a long way, baby, to get to where you are today. You've got your own cigarette now, baby. You've come a long way. Remember that commercial? Virginia Slims, 1969. 
You've come a long way, but that's really condescending, isn't it? Anyway, the Slim Store, formed in 1970, the Virginia Slim Circuit became the basis of what would later be the WTA, Women's Tennis Association. Uh, the women, the players, dubbed the original nine, rebelled against the United States Lawn Tennis Association due to the inequity in pay from men and women in comparison. The nine, Billie Jean King, Rosie Casals, Nancy Ritchie, Peaches Barkowitz, Kirsty Pidgeon, Valerie Ziegenfuss, Julie Heldman, Carrie Melville-Reed, and Judy taggart Dalton. All the players were putting their tennis careers at risk. But it succeeded. They dared the USLTA to throw them out. They didn't. Now, they took blood money. They took blood money from um, uh, Philip Morris. Uh, Billie Jean King in 1983 is, is you know, confronted. Why did you take this money? Now, she told me they took the money. They had no choice. Nobody was going to pay them. Nobody was going to pay them. So they took whatever was available. They didn't like it, but they took it. She said in 1983, taking the Virginia Slim's money, I believe in free enterprise system. It's up to women herself to make that choice, whether to smoke or not smoke. The most important thing is that we're well informed and we make our own decisions. Uh, Edith Merlo was the director of marketing for Philip Morris USA, which made uh, the Virginia Slim's. And uh, they were the sponsors from 71 to 78. She said, when we get involved in any promotion, it's obviously to create a greater visibility for our brand name, but we never ever ask a player to endorse our product. But she did. They may have not said, oh, here's Virginia Slims, but uh, they were playing in a tennis court surrounded by signage from Virginia Slims. Brandy Chastain interviewed her in 2008. She was a member of the 1999 U.S. Uh, women's soccer team that won the World Cup. She was the one that stripped down, uh, as you can see. I said to her one day, why are women's leagues failing? She said, very simple. We need a good old girls network. In other words, women become CEOs and decision makers. We'll get the money from them. The men have it. Credit cards. i got a question for you. Mm. How many of you had credit cards in your own name before 1974? And I'm not talking about store cards. I'm talking about uh, things like American Express. How many of you had uh, you had a credit card in your own name? What what card was it? Amex. Was it before 1974. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're one of the few. Yes. I had the American Express. But but you're not a woman. I'm talking about women. Okay. I'm talking about women. So, I mean, so you were the one of the few. Anyway, Billie Jean King told me, she said, you know, I'm winning all these tournaments. I'm making the money in the house, although her husband was a lawyer. And she said, I couldn't get a credit card in my own name. She couldn't get a credit card. Now, you get store credit cards. And maybe, just maybe, a supermarket credit card. And it was a charge plate, if you remember that. Uh, many banks required single, divorced, or widowed women to bring a man along with them to co-sign for a credit card. And some discounted the wages of women by as much as 50% when calculating their credit card limits. In October 1974, the President, Gerald Ford, signed the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which made it illegal to discriminate against someone based on their gender, race, religion, and national origin. In other words, women, here's your credit card now. It took until 1974 for banks to issue, or, or money people to issue credit cards, for the most part, to women. Bank, there was a bank in New York. Women's Bank, the first women's bank. It was uh, formed by a woman by the name of Judy H. Mello. It was called the first women's bank. The bank was a creation of the feminist movement, established in April 1975. First bank in the United States ever to be operated by women for women at a time when its founder said women were given the short shrift by other banks. Um, as things changed and evolved, the women's bank's business uh, began languishing and it was sold to investors that strengthened its finances but got rid of the name. 
Oh, there they are, credit cards. A report 10 years ago, 10 years ago, found that women still paid more for credit cards. According to a study by the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, women pay a half point higher interest than men. That was 10 years ago. Title IX, well, it opened the door for women uh, in sports and other fields, including medicine and the law. Title IX bars sex discrimination in any educational program or activities that receives federal funding, including athletics. And there is Birch Bay with the Purdue Boilermakers uh, track and field team, women's team, working with them after Title IX. Now, Title IX, today, it's thought to be a sports bill, but it wasn't. Donna De Verona, who won those two gold medals in 1964, and I told Donna, you can't lie about your age. Everybody knows you're going to be 75. I told her that the other day. She nearly slammed, slammed the phone on me. <laughs> ah, it's okay. Donna and I have been friends for 35 years, so it's, it's fine. Uh, Title IX was a Civil Rights Act applied to education, said Donna De Verona, who was involved in the 1972 fight and continues to be vigilant in making sure Title IX does not get watered down in any way. Basically, it said in law school, medical school, sports was thrown in. You should never have mentioned sports. In fact, you should never have mentioned anything except equal educational opportunities. At its inception, opponents of the law argued that girls and women were not interested in Sports participation and opening up new opportunities would not only undermine men's sports, but bankrupt schools, budgets nationwide. You have to pay for the women, and we're gonna, it's going to bankrupt you. This is John Tower. He's a senator from Texas. 1974, May 20th, uh, he proposes the Tower Amendment, which would exempt revenue-producing sports, like football, uh, from uh, determinations of Title IX compliance. The amendment is uh, rejected, but it spread misinformation, saying that it was a sports equity law, not an anti-discrimination civil rights law. Jacob Javits, liberal New York senator, Republican liberal. Uh, he was there until 1981, and he was serving with uh, ALS, which made him totally, totally uh, impotent. But he was running again in 1980 for the Senate seat, even though he was dying. July 1974, Jacob Javits submits an amendment directing health, education, and welfare to issue regulations that provide for reasonable provisions considering the nature of a particular sport that clarifies that event and uniform expenditures on sports with larger crowds or more expensive equipment doesn't have to be matched in sports without similar needs. Again, protect the men football players. Hey, women, hey, if your uniforms are ripped, torn, it's your problem. You fix it. We're going to take care of the men. Walter Byers, he was the head of the National Collegiate Athletic Association. His job is to protect every, every athlete in college, in universities, men or women. February 17, 1976, the NCAA charges the legality of Title IX. Saving college football? Of course. Well, last year, there was finally a woman who played major college football. Her name, Sarah Fuller. She was a kicker. Uh, Title IX changed how sports played in the country. Before 1972, the U.S. General Accounting Office showed that 32,000 women participated in college sports. 163,000 by 1999, and by 2018, 216,378. Men no longer get 95% of the dollars they mark for sports, and that is causing a lot of problems in the male fraternity because a good many coaches think that Title IX has taken away their ability to get the best players for their teams because they can't spend the kind of scholarship money on their teams, although that has changed because college players could sell their names and their faces to companies and make some money. Title IX. Uh, men's sports programs, yes, they've been eliminated. But oddly, Title IX was never meant to level out college sports and give women sports opportunities. The original intent was to give women a fair chance being accepted in school and for women professors 
to get equal opportunities at advancing within the system. Now let me ask a question after I read you this, has Title IX worked? By 1994, women received 38% of the degrees earned in the United States uh, compared to 9% in medicine. 40 in 72. 43% of law degrees compared with 7% in 1972. Now, this is one generation. This is one entire generation, 1973 to 1994. Did it work? Did Title IX work for women? Yes or no? Uh, now, this is a little tough to quantify because sometimes it takes about 8, 10 years to get your doctoral degree. But anyway, 44% of all doctoral degrees in 1994 went to women compared to 25% in 1977. Shelly, you can't hear me right now, so put down the burner phone. He's gonna, I know he's trying to call me. He passed away three years ago, Shelly. Shelly once had an interesting question. When you die and go to the hereafter, what time zone are you in? Now, he was in the Pacific time zone, so I assume, since he was buried in Los Angeles, he's still in the Pacific time zone. Nobody had ever asked a question like that before. But knowing Shelley the way I did, that makes sense. One of the five most influential men in women's sports in the 1970s. Pre-1972, very few women lawyers, doctors, scientists, nurses, teachers, secretaries, career for most women. Girls didn't play too many sports. Girls took square dancing and home economics. How many of you took square dancing? You did. You did. How many of you took home economics? Us guys who really needed the home economics, we weren't allowed to take it. Without Title IX, there'd be no U.S. Uh, World Cup soccer championship team, no WNBA professional women's sports leagues. Almost every female, in fact, every female athlete in the U.S. today has benefited from Title IX in one way or another. Nor would there be women scientists, mathematicians, or computer analysts. But are women still second-class citizens in schools? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. This is the uh, basketball tournament, which starts next week. College basketball tournament. Last year. Pandemic. Pandemic year. But the guys in Indianapolis, this is their workout room. The women in San Marcos, Texas, that is their workout room. Uh, slight difference? I mean, you could buy that set at Costco. In fact, I know you could buy that set at Costco because I saw it at Costco just yesterday over in uh, Norwalk. This, this is a full gym. It's 2021. Okay, it's COVID. Uh, the men's basketball tournaments held in Indianapolis and the men's teams were given better COVID tests while the people connected to the women's team near San Antonio got a less accurate test. The training equipment available to the women's teams not equal to what the men's received. How could you give women, forget the equipment, the COVID uh, test. How do you give women less of a test? They did. Oh, by the way, on the left is the women's food mess. On the right is the men's. Looks like a Swanson TV dinner, uh -huh. doesn't it? Guys have all these choices. Food options were limited to the women. And there were complaints about the swag bags given to the players, that the men got all these toys and the women got not very little. So here's the head of the NAA, NAA National Collegiate Athletic uh, Athletic. National Collegiate Athletic Association, Dr. Mark Emmert, who I have no respect for, but he just got a multi-million dollar four-year uh, deal from uh, the colleges, so they must have respect for him. And he's offering an apology. Uh, he said, none of this should have ever happened, but it did. Men and women did not get equal treatment in the COVID-19 bubble in 2021. So what's the future? Well, we know we're living in a time where a certain party, their basic goal is to roll back women's rights. Now, that's going to be difficult because you know how many women lawyers there are out there? Lots of them. 
hands off Title IX. And here is Alice Paul. Alice Paul wrote the first Equal Rights Amendment in 1923 or so. Uh, Alice Paul was a suffragette. And Alice Paul was, uh, went on a hunger strike in the 19-teens to get the vote. Um, she was committed to an insane asylum. She was so rabid that she was ready to kill herself and make herself a martyr for the vote. She did uh, live long enough to see Title IX pass. Women need to know this. Education is not a right. Education is guaranteed through federal law, and there's some provisions on that. I mean, there's not, uh, I mean, there has been some rollback over the last five years in some of the Title IX provisions, including, uh, again, women who have encountered violence and, and how you go about reporting it and all that other stuff. But uh, Title IX, education is not a woman's right. And I'm surrounded by women. I have a daughter, I have two granddaughters, and a daughter-in-law, right? So I have a lot of women around. And I told my daughter as she was growing up, she was born in 1983, don't let the bastards get you down. You got Title IX. And I got two, two granddaughters, one's a little more than two and a half, one is four months old, and I'm already pounding it into my two and a half year old's head, you're as good as anybody. Now, I'm not going to tell her, don't let the bastards wear you down. But I do tell her, you know, she, you know, hey, you know, you're, you're smart, you know, you're good, you know, especially when she does cartoon routines like me, with me, like rabbit season, duck season, and all that stuff. Uh, I realized that there's quite a difference when I was growing up in the 60s to now. But there are people who want to roll back rights. And women need to know that education is not a right. It's federal law. And there's a woman who made it. That's uh, the Hawaiian governor, uh, Lingle, uh, Linda Lingle, back in Maui, the home place of... Uh, uh, Patsy Mink, and she was the governor of, uh, of Hawaii. She grew up in Missouri, moved to Hawaii, and became the governor. Anyway, any questions, any comments? The floor is all yours. Have any comments? Yes, go ahead. Um, what about uh, 